Hello, today I'm going to share with you seven things that surprised me when I first moved to France seven years ago. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you're new here, welcome. If you enjoy content about life in France, moving abroad, or finding the confidence and courage to live life on your terms, be sure to subscribe. If you are already a subscriber, Thank you. I recently hit a big milestone here on YouTube. I am now in the YouTube Partner Program, and it's all thanks to you. My name is Patricia Brooks, and seven years ago, I decided I was going to leave my job and move to France where I didn't know anybody so that I could find myself. I could learn French and write my second book. But before I did it, I wasn't sure it was possible. But after having done it, it feels amazing. And now I help women who have this desire, this dream in their heart to make a move to a foreign country, but who sometimes lack the confidence or courage to get there on their own. I help them to build that confidence and courage so that they can go from surviving in a country that no longer suits them to living and thriving in one that does. And today on this video, I'm going to share with you seven things that surprised me when I first got here. This is something I've been thinking about over the last couple of months as I put the finishing touches on book number three, which still doesn't have a title, but I am this close to finishing it and I can't wait to get it out to you. And this topic has to do with what my first impressions were when I first got to France. What things surprised me? Now, the first of the seven is that everywhere I went, I would hear this sentence being spoken. Didn't matter where I went, if I was at the prefecture or if I was at a bank or if I was at a cell phone store, even having coffee with a friend, I'd hear this all the time. And it was, c'est pas possible. It's not possible. Now, why in the world would this bother me? And why do French people say it all the time? Well, it bothers me because as a life coach, I work with people to help them to do things that they don't believe is possible. And so when somebody says it's not possible, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that is why it really stood out to me and why it really bothered me so much. And it wasn't until three years in to my life in France when I read the book, The Bonjour Effect, that I realized why I was hearing this so much. And according to this book, French people typically start with no, right? If you ask them for something, you might not most likely won't get a yes off the bat. You might get a simple possible or some other response that is not affirmative. And then you have to work to get to a yes. And I think that simple possible is just one way of saying no in the beginning. So now that I've lived here for seven years, I can't tell you when the last time I heard simple possible was because it is just normal. I hear it probably all of the time, but it doesn't register the way it did that first year. So that's the first thing that surprised me when I moved to France. And the second thing was how polite French people can be. When people get off the bus in Perpignan and they exit through the back door, they speak to the bus driver from the back door and they say, Merci, monsieur. Au revoir, monsieur. And to me, that really surprised me because I didn't ride buses much in the United States, but I find it hard to believe that that is something that we would do. <laughs> now, if that is something that you hear in your city on a bus, let me know in the comments. I'd be interested to hear that. But to me, that was surprising. Another place where I see this politeness is at boutiques, when you go into a boutique, they will say, bonjour, madame. And when you leave, they'll say, au revoir, or bonne journée, when you leave. It's just something that happens. And the other day, I went into a boutique, and I just automatically said bonjour before they even said it. 
And when I left, I said au revoir. So I think I'm becoming a little bit French in that respect. I love it. It surprised me at first, but I like how polite that is. Now, the third thing that surprised me when I moved to France was something that has to do with a food product. I arrived on January 25th, 2018, and this was the very day that there was a promotion going on for the spread Nutella. Now, Nutella is a spread made of hazelnuts, and I don't particularly care for it. Peanut butter, yes. Nutella, no. But on this particular day, they had a promotion going on at the supermarket for this product to be 70% off. And as you can see from this footage, there was pure mayhem in the supermarkets that day. And so that surprised me that a product could incite such uh, excitement in French people because typically French people are pretty even keeled, <laughs> but <laughs> Nutella brought it out of them. So when you are traveling or when you're living in a foreign country, what was the most surprising thing to you when you first arrived? Let me know in the comments. Now, number four has to do with taste buds, my taste buds. I absolutely love to look in patisserie windows at the pastries. They look so pretty and so delicious. And the first several times I went into a bakery and decided I was going to get something, I didn't know what they what the things were what they tasted like and so I just went on looks I'm like oh that looks pretty I'm gonna try that and I get it home and I bite into it and often I was disappointed because my taste buds are American taste buds I was raised on really really sweet sweets and the French have um, a more subtle sweetness in their pastries and it's not a bad thing. It's just different for me. And so that surprised me that, oh, it could look so good and I could be so disappointed in eating it. Recently, this was, I was reminded of this because I had a birthday and I treated myself to a pastry. And I said, you know what? I hope that I'm not disappointed, but I I'm not going to bake a cake like I did a couple years ago. I made a birthday cake from scratch and the icing from scratch, and it was delicious, but it was a whole cake and it was just way too much. And so I said, yeah, I'm going to treat myself and hopefully I won't be disappointed. So I got this chocolate flan, which was kind of like a chocolate cream pie, and I got it home um, and ate it the next day for my birthday, and it was delicious. It was sweet enough, and I don't know if that's because my taste buds are changing or whether this particular pastry was just a little sweeter, but that surprised me. Number five has to do with the cost of medical care here. Now, my first couple of years here, although I was eligible for the carte vitale, I didn't know it. And so I didn't apply for it and I paid for my medical out of pocket. Going to the doctor was 25 or 29 euros. And that was reasonable to me as an American. When I would go to get blood tests, paying 35 or 40 euros for blood test, that was doable. It wasn't something that was so expensive that it was prohibitive. When I'd go to the pharmacy to get prescriptions, I'd go in and they'd ask me for my carte vitale. And I'd say, oh, I don't have one. And they'd look at me like I had three heads. I'm like, I don't have one, sorry. And then they'd go and get my prescriptions and they'd tell me how much it was, five euros or 10 euros. And I'm like, is that all you want? And I would pay it and I'd go about my business. That surprised me that it was so much more affordable than in the United States, where if you go into a pharmacy and you don't have insurance, you can pay hundreds of dollars for prescriptions. So um, that was a pleasant surprise for me. Now, I've applied for my carte vitale, I have that, and that is taken care of. 
But in the beginning, I didn't know, and I was pleasantly surprised by the cost of medical. Now, I moved to this region of France because of the sunny weather and because of the warmer or the more mild winters. And I was happy with that. But I moved to France in January, at the end of January. So my first week here, I was surprised by something I hadn't considered. And that was how windy it can be here. There's a wind called the Tramontagna in my region. And it blows through for three days or six days or even nine days straight. And I remember about seven days in, I went for my morning walk and I could barely stand up. Those tall, spindly palm trees that really drew me in that May day when I fell in love with Perpignan, they were blowing in the wind and they were almost horizontal. They were fighting that wind. And because it was winter, it was cold. So I was not expecting that. I was surprised by the wind. Now I know to expect it. I know if it's a windy day, that maybe it's not a good day to go for a walk. Never considered that even if it's a bright blue day outside, but the wind is blowing, that it, I would consider it not a nice day. But now I do because I've experienced the Tramontagna here. And finally, number seven, I was surprised for the first couple of years about how late the sun rises in the fall and the winter here. And I was surprised because I wake up with the sun. I wasn't waking up with an alarm clock because I wasn't going into a job anymore. So I didn't need to. But I would wake up so much later. Eight o'clock, I'd be waking up. I'm like, oh my gosh, Patricia, what's happening to you? You're getting so lazy. And it wasn't until maybe my the end of my third year, the fall of my third year, that I realized that the sun rises an hour, hour and 15 minutes later than it did in Richmond, Virginia. And that was substantial. And I'm not the only one it affects. I have a client who moved from Philadelphia and she said it too. She's like, I really don't like how late the sun rises in the fall and the winter. And she said something similar, like she likes to get up and do her you know, morning activity. And because the sun doesn't rise as early, she feels a little bit um, like she's slacking. The other thing is that while the sun rises later in the fall and the winter, in the summertime, the sun doesn't set until 1015 or 1030 at night. So that means like if you're going to have fireworks, you can't have fireworks until 1030 p.m. In Richmond, in New Jersey, where I grew up, if we had fireworks, we could have fireworks at 9.15 in the evening because it was dark enough. That is a huge difference and takes some getting used to. But slowly but surely, I am. And most of these things that surprised me in the beginning don't surprise me anymore. I've adjusted or I'm just used to them and I know that this is the way things are. But it's interesting to look back and see where I was and what surprised me. Which of these seven things surprises you the most? Let me know in the comments. Now, if moving abroad is something you're considering and you feel a little bit frustrated with the progress you're making or the lack thereof, because there's something that's holding you back, I'd love to have a conversation to see where you are, what you're struggling with, and if our working together could help you get there sooner and with more ease. So check out the link to my calendar in the description or go to thecouragecatalyst.com forward slash future expat and schedule a time for us to talk. I look forward to that. Now, if you enjoyed this video, I have some other videos about the cultural differences that surprised me. And you can check them out up here. All right. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, share it with friends, 
subscribe, and I will see you next time. Bye for now.